high speed transmission uh he also recently completed 12 years at uh, ultimate transmission so congratulations mr michael our second guest from finland is mr uh yeah our second guest from finland is mr anchi lahikoinen he is a consulting engineer at uh, smeklav he is into r and d and design of motors and he also offers consultancy services aluminum can be used to replace copper in electric motors which can save cost and waste Uh, weight, but it increases the binding resistance and decreases the motor performance. So, as we are trying to advance technology, we always try to optimize the cost and get better performance. So, to solve this, the solution is radial hairpin winding. This is some what we will be discussing in this episode, and we will try to cover. Our guests will try to cover both the manufacturing and design aspects of it. So I would like to welcome both of our guests on behalf of Gyanaki and today's participants. Uh, welcome, Mr. Michael, and welcome, Mr. Anti. Uh, if you would like to speak a few words before going ahead with the presentation. Okay. I I'm going to take the first step to introduce people to what hairpin windings actually are. um their pros and cons where they're getting used and why they're getting used and i'm going to use a a white paper prepared by a company called motor design limited who build the a software called motorcad that is distributed by ansys um i'm 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 using that because it 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 it's very good background to this to the particular subject of what is hairpin then i will move on to how we can use our uh what we call vcat which is variable conductor area technology to Im- Im- improve the performance of hairpin windings and in particular to be able to move from copper to aluminium by using this variable area technique then then auntie is going to go through uh, some uh, some of the processes that he would use in order to design a motor for a particular specification then we'll go to question and answer i think most uh, i will try to be as brief as possible so that we have plenty of time for for question and answer so i will now go to i will now open up um this document which is this document by nut motor design there is a hairpin winding which i think is uh is uh, pr- familiar with a lot of people now can everyone see that um yes sir it's a screen is visible okay um so that they look at the advantages and disadvantages in a in a in a simplistic way the advantages mostly stem from the ability to increase the uh, slot fill ratio you get better thermal performance and you can build these things with highly automated manufacturing processes which probably isn't so relevant in india but this is why you see a lot of use of hairpin in europe i i believe um because it it becomes fully automated the disadvantage is the, there's less flexibility in the winding configurations and there's a an effect or greater ac losses as the frequency as the ac frequency increases and higher cost the higher cost is there because you need you use more copper um although the although the automated manufacturing process can be implemented you lose you you use more copper and that's what we are particularly focused on so there is there is a some images of how the hairpin works there's a hairpin that is inserted into the stator and that, that, that it has a particular type of bend here so that they nest together then it is bent and then it is welded so you get that sort of a that is the hairpin after insertion and bending 
there are methods of building the whole circuit of hairpin winding and inserting generally from the outside for an outrunner type of motor. The uh, motor, motor CAD can now, um, can now model the hairpin winding and give you relatively complex winding diagrams alerting you to any problem you may create if you don't follow the rules associated with the hairpin winding um, uh, the, the hairpin winding configuration because there are certain rules particularly once you're introducing parallel windings which must have uh, equal conductivity um, or, or 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 you get an imbalance in them so they they the, when you use this software it tells you what options you've got it then delivers an efficiency map the same as any other efficiency map it it gives more detail on the winding and how the windings work um, and and it studies in more detail the effect of using um, uh, different numbers of conductors in in the slot and what that may do to the efficiency because when you have two conductors like that the the AC losses become quite severe with four it reduces significantly with six even more and with eight even more but when you move from about six to eight, the DC losses start to overwhelm the improvement and it's almost not worth it. So there, they, they, in this paper, I, I would recommend that, it, that people find this paper and download it if they're interested in this thing. It's a very good background. <clears throat> but they end up with these analyses, which are very useful with a motor operating a WLTP in an NEDC cycle using two conductors, four conductors, six conductors, eight conductors, where you get a significant improvement in the in the overall efficiency operating these cycles of about 0.5% moving from two to four. Um, but not much moving from four to six and almost the reverse moving from six to, to eight. So most OEMs are looking at four conductors. With our technology, we, we may look more at two conductors, depending on the speed. For lower speed motors, two conductors is good enough. This is, um, uh, this is a motor that can spin out to uh, 16,000 RPM, I think. Uh, where are we? Um, winding lies. Oh, what am I doing? I've lost that. Oops. Where are we? No. Ah. Um. There's, there's, oh, they're, 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 yes, they're the two. At 12,000 RPM, the AC losses dominate the DC losses, but at 1,000 RPM, the, um, the AC losses are, are very small. So if we're looking at a, at a, at a motor that's, uh, with a terminal speed of 12,000 RPM, I think you would often be looking at two windings, not four. But if the if the speed of the motor, and six pole motor, if the speed of the motor was 16,000 RPM, you would start to think about four. So we get that, then the, 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 Reality is that the hairpin windings can now be modelled very accurately using these softwares and Auntie 
doesn't use the software. He uses his own software, but he can analyze these things as well in the design of the motor. Now I will I will get rid of that and um, I'll cl close that off and then reopen this diagram. Th this is a can we see this diagram? So it's visible. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, the, the this is a uh, an example of copper hairpin windings in a distributed wound ax uh, radial flux motor. Uh, you can see the winding, the loop of winding, which goes up here and then down here, comes out the bottom and then travels across here where it's welded to another one that's come from here, forming that continuous wave formation as it moves around the as it moves around the motor. This this would be a single wind in this in this particular configuration. Now with our with our concept we forget about the the winding being a continuous strand of wire of equal cross section, and we build using uh, um, die cast, using a die cast method, a winding where the cross section of the winding in this region is much bigger than the cross section in the slot. The cross section in the slot is exactly the same as the copper. And when we do that, the improved thermal conductivity of this section offsets the reduced, not thermal conductivity, electrical conductivity. The improved electrical conductivity in the end winding region offsets the loss of electrical conductivity in the slot. And you can end up with an aluminium winding uh, which you could still call a hairpin, although it, it, it isn't it isn't really a double hairpin, it's more like a half hairpin. The aluminium uh, hairpin can have exactly the same uh, DC and AC resistance as the copper one. And maybe an opportunity to shorten the length of the motor and an opportunity to use direct conduction to conduct heat directly out to the casing. Whereas, whereas with the copper, the copper windings do not conduct heat directly to the casing and have to use the air or often oil spray to, to get there. Um, now, so I'll, I'll close that off. Um, where are we? I, I think we'll go. Yeah, we'll go back. We'll go back to where we were. Okay. Uh, that that I I think that is um, more or less what the thrust of this is about. It it because it it. Although there are many other ways of using this technology, you, it, it can use copper, for instance, and improve the performance of the motor without reducing the cost. It, um, it can actually, use, we can die cast with a copper slot conductor and an aluminium end conductor because using a, an insert of copper. That, so it, it opens up the the uh, scope of motor design considerably uh, because before this was available, the hairpin wound motors were stuck with a conductor of the same uniform cross, cross section. Uh, exactly why no one thought about this, we don't know, but <laughs> we can find no evidence of anyone actually doing this and therefore no evidence of uh, how it could be utilized. So now what I'm going to do, we, we've got, we'll try, we'll try to keep 30 minutes for questions. What I'm going to do now is ask Auntie 
to describe how if someone wanted to design a motor using using hairpins or using hairpins and VCAT in copper or aluminium, how he would like to work with someone on that on that process. Okay, Andy, over to you. <laughs> okay, thank you. So maybe before I speak about the design process itself, I, I would like to recap the benefits of this technology as I see them. Because I think this is a very brilliant idea. In fact, this VCAT for traction motors, because typically traction motors are such that the end winding has quite a significant performance on the motor performance. Uh, effect on the motor performance because traction motors are usually quite short in their axial length. They are not like very long and the cylinder shape. They are like blocks to maximize the performance basically and also due to space constraints. And at the same time, the pole count is not very high. It's between uh, four and eight usually. And what this means is that the length of the end winding is quite significant. If we consider the entire coil length, the active part is usually between 50 and maybe 70% of the total length, meaning that the end winding length is also quite a significant fraction. So if we can fully utilize the end winding volume that is now air, empty air, and use that for conductor material by using this kind of variable cross section shaped aluminium or even copper. It's possible to quite significantly reduce the DC resistance of the winding and correspondingly bondingly increase the performance. And also if we can maximize the contact area or even enable like physical contact between the end winding volume and the casing, uh, the cooling gets much easier because spray cooling of end windings is, well, it's another complication. You need the spray nozzles, you need to circulate the oil there somewhere. You need oil in the first place. If you have a jacket cooling, you can use water as the coolant, which is of course easier. You don't need like separate cooling circuits for oil and then another for water or anything like that. So yes, I see. I see many potential benefits in this technology. How the design process usually goes is that. Well, it's a fairly typical engineering project, I would say. Uh, the client, they have an application in mind. They have some requirements in mind. Usually it's a motor obviously for some two-wheeler, three-wheeler light commercial vehicle. They have some ideas about the speed, torque, power requirements. We would go through them, see if the requirements make sense, if they are feasible, if we would be better served by changing something in the application area like the gear transmission race. So if we could change that to got the total costs or complexity, for instance, to save some money somewhere by spending a little more money somewhere else. Stuff like that. When we have the requirements in place, well, then it's a typical engineering process. I personally work on the electromagnetic and thermal design of the motor itself mostly, so that I can do very well optimize it for any drive cycle, anything you have in mind, any application environment. So I can take care of that. Usually I don't do the detailed mechanical design like uh, doing CAD drawings for the motor mounting or anything like that. So usually that is either handled by the client side or subcontracted to somebody else. So what I do is strictly the electromagnetic design, like uh, CAD uh, simulation work, drawings of the motor, cross-section, uh, 
winding diagrams material guides what materials to use, what kind of permanent magnets, how to segment them, if to segment them. And depending on the process, there's a project that is more or less back and forth involved with the client because occasionally it can happen that okay we get some first results we come up with another idea how they could be changed to better serve the application so we made some changes as needed so nothing <laughs> nothing okay. set in stone in other words birds so yeah i guess that concludes my uh, speeds but i think my my input on that is that you you must be fair be as certain as you can be about the required performance of the motor before you move to involving um, a, a, a consultant on the design of the motor and uh, yes, exactly. and and of, of, often i see people not quite sure what they want to what they want to do particularly in india because India is a special case. The vehicles in India will be very different from the vehicles everywhere else in the world um, because the Indian economy is almost like a special economy. Um, and, and I think that is what is, that is often what is slowing down the development of some of these things in India and why the Indian OEMs tend to go and buy something from China that seems to be cheap and force it to fit the application. And that, I would suggest, has to start stopping with Indian OEMs thinking much more clearly about what the product is. OK, so uh, I, I think we're I, I think we're done ready for some ready for some questions. Um, oh. So, Michael, uh, can you share the uh, stator, uh, show the stator to the audience? Oh, oh okay. Uh, yeah, yes, I can, can't I? Uh, that, here's, a, here's a 3D model of a stator that is about the size of a Tesla Model 3. And inside it, there are two, there are two of these radial hairpins. So this would be a two-layer system which we're saying may be often done with four, but this this the, 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 this system, if I pull it out, that is one of the of these little components. You can see it has a slot conductor, which is the size that you would expect, and it would be the same as if it was copper, and the end conductor much bigger. And, and formed in a 3D shape that allows it to nest perfectly with the other one. So when you arrange a whole lot of these around the circle, this, this section here is so, almost solid aluminium and, and can conduct heat very directly to the outside. Here's a, here's, here's a, a hairpin wound uh, uh, um, uh, generator out of my car <laughs> that broke down the other day. This, this, these uh, little um, generators, or not, what, um, yeah, can't think of it now, but they, they have been using hairpins for about 20 years. This is a Toyota. Uh, exactly why I'm not 100% sure, but I believe it would be to do with cooling. It's a lot easier to blow air through these these end windings to remove the heat than to blow air over a bundle of tightly wound copper windings. I think it would be heat. It also, this is also a single wind that goes, there's, there's, there's two layers in this, one inside the other, uh, done in this, in this particular configuration that goes round in one continual wind, terminating with just just the three phases and the star connection. So it's a very simple thing. Whether you can keep it as simple as that when we move to real motor designs uh, will depend on on the actual application. Is that what you wanted to? 
Is that does everyone sort yes. of understand that? Uh, yes, sir. And and why this conductor, which is made of aluminium, we'll say, would be the same uh, re would have the same resistance made out of aluminium, which is only which is 60 percent or, or has a, a resistance of 1.6 times the copper because this bit is so much bigger and this piece that piece and that piece is roughly the same length as that piece um, that's that's all that has to be understood and when we have the software from Motorsolve worked out or or in the meantime, Auntie uh, giving us the 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 a, a design that he can do manually, if you like. You can look at or, or the 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 uh, the effect of making the end overhang bigger. In other words, moving this out further, um, which makes this even bigger, or the effect of putting four conductors because they nest in exactly the same way, or six conductors for any for any motor design so that the motor design itself can be optimised. And if you are if, in a, this is a, this is a 150 kilowatt sort of motor, it would have a 10 or 11 kilograms of copper, which would be replaced with about four kilograms of aluminium, which which would reduce the cost from of the material from $100 to $20. That's that's what's most interesting for India because India will will be looking for every for every way of cutting cost. Also India has lots of aluminium and not so much copper. <laughs> I think I think that's right, but it's very well and it has some very expert Aluminium die cast die casters, so making them, um, uh, making these these slightly complicated pieces should not be a challenge in in India. Any any more from you, Shafid? Yes. Mr. Shekhar will take the question. Uh, okay. Okay. Uh, Hello, uh, Michael and uh, Antti. Uh, this is Harsh here. Uh, I'll, I'll take up some questions now. Uh, uh, so uh, first of all, thank you very much uh, for your uh, presentation and, and you know, uh, also also making it uh, uh, with an India focus or. Uh, uh, so the first question is actually from, from someone from the audience, uh, Mr. Kishore. Uh, is asking that in case of using uh, aluminum windings for motors, uh, which type of winding is going to be beneficial? Is it a rectangular type uh, or normal radial conductors? I think I can answer that. It it this is really um, only related to to forms of hairpin winding where the. The difference, the difference between a hairpin wound motor and a and a wire wound mo motor or stator, is really to do with the size of the wire. Um, in this particular piece, this, this the, the, and and the size of the wire is related to the number of conductors that run in the slot. Typically, when you're winding a motor with with wires, you're dealing with we're dealing with wires that are one millimeter in diameter, um, and that and and it would be impossible, and you and you'd have fifty to a hundred of them in the in the uh, in the slot itself, and uh, and it would be not not necessarily impossible, but it would be unrealistic to make special shapes. At 100 special shapes to fill in that slot, so it's really saying: Are we moving from wire wound to hairpin, which it it which is a worthwhile thing to do? And once you decide that the hairpin wound motor can be 
useful, then the option to go to an aluminium winding becomes possible. But you, it, it's a two-step process, wire wound to hairpin to it, to aluminium. This has answered the question, Mr. Kishore, so I said uh, it's answered the question for him. Okay. Uh, yes. Uh, so there is one more question. Uh, does hairpin winding require any special kind of insulation? It's uh, from our audience only. Do you, either of us could answer that question. I mean, uh, the simple answer is no, it doesn't. But it 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 requires a different method of of insulating because it's a square wire, um, and the insulation tends to thin out at the corners. And our particular winding requires even greater attention to how you coat the wire evenly with the insulation. There, there. I'm, I could also add that there are now that the winding is is rigid and does not require any bending, you can start to look at other forms of insulation, including some ceramics, including anodizing. The simplest way to deal with relatively low voltage um, uh, insulation, we believe, would be, would be anodizing, that you don't even need, which is very hard, has a reasonable dielectric strength, and is highly thermally, not, not highly, but is reasonably thermally conductive. And then there are some fancy versions of anodizing called, called uh, plasma uh, uh, electrolytic oxidation that, uh, that can give you very high thermal conductivity and excellent um, uh, dielectric strength. But we haven't done much research on that. For the moment, we're saying dip that in insulation, work out how to get an even coat. Um, okay. So like the uniformity is a very, very major factor in the coating, like uh, for the for getting better performance and durability. Uh, well, the, the as the voltage goes up, the yes. problem becomes greater. Okay. But, it, but with India operating often down at 72 volts, not even thinking about 800 volts, we don't think this is much of a challenge in India. <laughs> in Europe, where they're already almost talking 800 volts as standard, it is a challenge. But it's also a challenge for the copper hairpins. Okay, so like in India, the maximum voltage we, which we could go for is a Tata Nexon EV having a 320 volt system architecture. Uh, and like so and in like in the uh, LCV variant we are uh, trying like it's a uh, 72 volt is more common so so we are in the, like we are in the lower voltage range that's as of right. now. And, and we, we we believe that's another area to save money because because simple hard anodizing will give you a coating that is almost indestructible and good enough for 72 volts and, and, uh, and uh, relatively low cost. Okay. okay. The thing so, is, Michael, that uh, we, we have sort of uh, moved away from 72 volt architectures uh, completely, especially when it, when it comes to pass card applications. So except for like a very uh, low uh, weight uh, cargoes like L5 categories, uh, pretty much all architectures are now looking at moving to the global standard of 300, 320 volts because okay. with the current going higher, uh, uh, you know, the system current will have to go really high if we stick to 72. So okay. 300, 320 is going to become the norm now. And uh, uh, just actually my follow up question to this, uh, when you say that there are challenges uh, as you go higher in the voltage uh, levels um, from a, let's say from an application of a bus or, you know, so like a public, like a transport bus or a public bus, which is going to use motors that are much more uh, like system voltages are going to be very high uh, and the motor sizing is going to be pretty high as well. Uh, any any challenges you see there, uh, or if you can highlight what challenges you would see there with with the with this design? Um, the 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 challenges don't really start to become significant until you get over four hundred volts, um, where 
we're getting a an anodized coat, a simple anodized coating to do the job would get difficult. Um, the the general the general feeling is that the breakdown voltage for a hard anodized surface is about six or seven hundred volts. That's that's actually where it will start to break down. So okay. that, that, there are two layers of insulation between any two conductors. There is a limit to the thickness of of hard ox, of hard anodizing where it becomes difficult to do, which is about 50 microns. So two layers of 50 microns, you 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 will be safe at 400 volts, but at 800 volts, you 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 might have to do a lot of testing. I think that's so you 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 might have to. You, it, it might cost money to get that to work to go up to 800 okay. volts, but I don't think it'll cost a great deal to get it to work at 400. And you can still use conventional um, um, coatings, but you okay. but you have to use a different type of coating system to make sure that the coating thickness is is uh, is even, basically, is mm. adequate and and even and doesn't contain pinholes. The, the the with a wire you're drawing the wire through often a a, a liquid of the you know a, a bath of the um, of of the insulating material and you can be very certain about the fact that the whole wire gets covered in the insulation. Right. Whereas if you start spraying something or 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 powder coating something you've got You've got to be, you've got to be careful. Is my belief. Therefore, the anodized coatings, which are uniform in their nature, are somewhat safer. But they run, they probably run out of, out of, out of um, capacity above 400 volts. Then you start to look at the, these plasma, plasma uh, electrolytic oxidation processes, and they get expensive. They're more expensive than anodizing. So, uh, but but it, when you move from 400 to 800 volts, everything gets more expensive. <laughs> Correct. Absolutely. Absolutely. So um, I think I it'll, it's yeah. one of the biggest benefits of moving to an 800 volt architecture for pass cars, at least, would be to would be really high performance applications and your exist. I mean, everything has to change now because the you know the, nothing is designed for 800 volt systems. Uh, but with the only intention being that the system current or system level current has to come down like that's running the system, which is basically why I think Porsche even considered going to 800 volt systems, right? I, I, my belief is that the 800 volt systems are a very big advantage for fast charging. Right. That 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 it's not really they improve the motor, the, the, the rest of the design. In fact, I think they make it more difficult. But when you've got an 800 volt system, you can charge without having a copper conductor going to the wire that's as big as your arm, <laughs> which is which is one of the limits for fast charging is the is the charging current and the copper when the copper conductor starts to weigh 20 kilograms or 30 you know or even 40 kilograms, it becomes a problem just to lift it across to your car. Whereas the, the, if, if it's a much higher voltage, if it's if it's twice the voltage, it's half the copper. Correct. Exactly. Yes. Yes. And and oh. and that may be why these uh, these guys are doing it. But but that's also when you have a hundred kilowatt hour battery, uh, you have to charge it fast, or you'll be sitting there too long to to uh, get a sufficient miles. Whereas in in India, I think even in these little commercial vehicles, it, it often the battery size will be less than 20 kilowatt hours. Would you agree? I mean, yes, yes, absolutely. So, so for last mile connectivity applications uh, and a lot of those intercity uh, cargo vehicles, uh, we won't be look. I mean, there there are uh, some categories or OEMs that are looking at around 30 kilowatt motors. Uh, but yes, you'd be right that the majority of those, uh, you know, one tonners is what we call them, uh, would definitely be in the area of 20 or 20 odd kilowatts. Yes, and they won't, they won't have big batteries 
and yes. so they don't need huge card charging currents. Agreed. Uh, so, so the the advantage of going to this this eight hundred volt system, I think, would be very long time coming in India. Yes. It, it, even if you want to buy a Porsche Taycan, you you'll be charging it up slowly. <laughs> you'll need two. <laughs> yes, yes, absolutely. I mean, I mean, I mean, even if we buy the the Porsche Taycan out here, or even if a vehicle comes up, I think the charging infrastructure will also have to meet that. So, absolutely. Um, okay, uh, I have a, a question for Antti actually, uh, something that he mentioned uh, from a design perspective where he said that, you know, his focus is on EMs and how uh, he tunes or customizes them from a drive cycle perspective. Uh, could you uh, talk a bit about that, Antti, if you don't mind? Yes. Uh Okay, let's say that the traditional approach for motor design has, of course, been a single operating point. You say you want a five kilowatt motor at this torque, this speed, and then you maximize the efficiency there. Or weight, whatever your goal is. In EVs, that's not very relevant because when you are actually driving a vehicle, it never stays at a certain operating point for a long time. Maybe when you are driving at a highway between cities, you might be there for a few hours at a time, but most of other times you are accelerating, stopping at the traffic lights, doing that again and again, popping in the countryside, driving a bit faster for a bit longer periods of time continuously. But in any case, you never stay at a certain operating point for a very long time. Instead, you move inside a rather wide speed and torque or speed and power envelope. And usually you will need a higher powers, uh, sorry, higher torques at low speeds and vice versa. But the point is that maximizing the efficiency for the nominal or rated point that goes into advertising materials. That is not a good approach usually, because if you maximize the efficiency at a certain operating point, you lose it somewhere else, more or less. So what should be done instead is that you pick a drive cycle, you either use one of the standardized ones like NEDC, WLPT, or even better if you have some measured data for a more realistic cycle in your area, your application environment, for instance. You use the data, you generate uh, operating maps for the motor, like uh, losses, efficiency across the speed torque range. Then you calculate uh, whatever you want over the entire operating cycle like the losses, uh, current draw, demagnetization risk, whatever. And you try to maximize the performance over the entire operating uh, or the entire drive cycle. And this can be done automatically by using modern optimization. It takes maybe one day or a few days to run it. Or if you don't have the time, you can tune it manually, spend half a day on it and get maybe, I don't know, 50, 70 percent of the best possible results. But anyways, that's briefly how it works. You optimize the behavior over the entire drive cycle that you have in mind. Right, uh, uh, you make a good point. Uh, transients are definitely something that uh, you know, you have to pick what suits or what your your application is going to see the most of. And and my my quick follow up to this is: Do you with with this particular design, like the rail hairpin design, uh, do you do you feel there is any sort of motor from a principal uh, app, you know uh, principal physics standpoint, like say S SRM versus uh, induction, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera, do you believe or do you feel there is any particular design which would suit this the best from having a wider uh, what do you call it? A wider bandwidth, basically, from a application standpoint. Okay, uh, 
Well, switch the reluctance machines might be problematic because they usually use concentrated windings and concentrated windings are usually not used with hairpins unless you have this kind of a so-called mutually coupled switch the reluctance machine. But the other topologies, I think it suits quite nicely, although let's say strong candidates for EV motors. Of course, at the moment, most of them are interior magnet, rare earth designs, but given that many people are trying to move away from rare earths, induction machines could be an option as could be synchronous reluctance machines with perhaps some ferrite magnet assistance. And this winding topology or this VCAT technology or aluminum hair, hairpins in general, I think I see no issue why they wouldn't fit them all, basically. Makes sense. Uh, uh, OK, I, I have one final question from mine before I switch back to some audience questions. And and this is uh, an area that is uh, that, you know, uh, I guess usually gets uh, uh, doesn't get much attention, but we all know that EVs, you know, are very silent in operation. Uh, we don't have engine noise to drown out the rest of the noise. Uh, so from a NVH perspective, um, are there any major differences between uh, uh, your technology uh, versus, uh, you know, the traditional uh, copper based as well as uh, uh, not the ones that are not radial hairpin type designs? Like, is there a big benefit or advantage to uh, from an NVH perspective or does it not matter too much? I would guess there is a small benefit. I'm not a noise specialist myself, but <laughs> in the motors usually one of the contributors to the noise is the end winding region and how the wires are winding their vibrates due to the Lorentz forces induced on them and that can be especially problematic in these kind of a wire wound machines because the individual wires they tend to vibrate it's not much an issue in hairpin windings because the winding structure the end winding structure is much stiffer and there's no physical contact between the different coil sides and i would guess it's even less of an issue with this VCAT technology because the end winding region will simply be so massive and so rigid that I wouldn't expect to see any significant vibrations over there. That's simply my hunt, my gut feeling on that topic. Right. Okay. Uh, I think I think that also answers one of the audience questions which was to do with since the conductors are solid any limitations on a vibration standpoint so i think i think your response tends to cover that um another one we have from the audience is uh what's the typical life we can expect from from hairpin motors um is, again is there a major uh, difference between the two or uh, are we looking at something some sort of a similar life cycle Okay, maybe I can <laughs> give my thoughts first. Okay, sure. when you think of motors, there are basically two critical components <laughs> usually <laughs> affecting the lifetime. First are the bearings. They are the most common type of failure. And that's simply a matter of mechanical design. Uh, bearing design vibrations, forces, stuff like that. That doesn't really differ between the technology technologies. The second most common issue is the insulation in the winding and usually insulation. Well, we have insulation classes based on the winding temperature and usually the higher the temperatures are the higher rated insulation you need, of course, and any any kind of significant thermal loading their high temperatures, high temperature peaks, they tend to shorten the lifetime. With respect to this kind of anodizing approach, how its lifetime behaves and depends on the thermal loads and so on. 
uh, that's definitely something to be studied. But again, one of the benefits here is that if we can reduce the temperature class or the maximum temperature rise by minimizing the end winding losses and eliminating the hot spots in the end winding, conducting the heat directly to the casing or the frame or water jacket, whatever you have. If you can minimize hot spots and minimize the overall average temperature, you should be able to improve the insulation life compared to. Yep. I might just add something there. The, from what I understand, uh, the the anodized coatings will will are unaffected by heat, basically unaffected by heat, and the aluminium, if it was aluminium or even copper, if you if you 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 can do some fancy things with copper too in anodizing. But the aluminium would melt out of the coating um, before the coating was damaged. So the the normal investigation of what of what what thermal what damage might be done thermally if you're using a semi ceramic or anodized coating, you, you almost you almost ignore. It'll never get hot enough to worry about it. They, their dielectric strength doesn't vary either with temperature. Um, so that's why that's why when I consider the lower voltage applications, I believe you can go straight there almost immediately because often the low voltage applications get hotter than the high voltage ones because they're running at very high currents. <laughs> um, and and the failure of low voltage motors is probably normally burning out the windings, um, whereas it, it, as it gets up into high voltage, it it might be some other form of failure. Uh, so potentially, a safer motor in in relation to heating. Okay, got it. Okay, hey, um, I think I think that that sort of rounds out the questions I had for you guys, uh, and and I think we've also sort of uh, run over a bit on time. Um, I uh, from the entire Gyaniki team, I would really really like to uh, thank you guys for uh, taking the time, being very descriptive, and you know I'm sure that a lot of people learned a lot about motors in general, and and of course the 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 new approach uh, that you guys are uh, have come up with. Um, if the audience has more questions, we'll you know please uh, go ahead and uh, address them to us, and we'll make sure that uh, both Michael and Antti, uh, you know, we will try and see if we can get them to answer them later. Uh, uh, both Michael and Andy, uh, again, thank you very much. And uh, would you guys like to uh, you know say a few words uh, before we close out the session uh, for this week? Andy, anything to say? I don't have anything. It's way too <laughs> early here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, for me it's a little bit better. But but uh, that was good. I'm 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 impressed by this little little technical um, technical platform. And uh, if you if you ever want something something else to be done, we uh -huh. I'd be I'd be happy to do it. That's fantastic. Uh, and that's thank you very sweet. much, Rekha, and the other members of your company for uh, putting this together in a very professional manner. Thank you. Thank you very much. And and uh, I mean, I, I would like to request you. I mean, if you did, if you since you did enjoy uh, being on the platform, uh, we'd like to make sure that you know you're at least on the invite list for the ones. This happens pretty much every Saturday. And uh, it's all about EV tech. Uh, you know, it's always something fun and a new topic somewhere. Uh, so I would really love it if you guys could make time to, you know, also be part of uh, this forum uh, in, in future events. OK, we're, we're definitely interested in being invited. Fantastic, we'll do so. OK, okay. Uh, Shekhar, any words from you before we, we close out? No, well, that, that's good. See, this was, uh, we are just getting into the deep dive on the technology side. Uh, typically, till now, uh, most of the sessions have been at a system level. Uh, just last two sessions, we have started going down deeper onto components. Uh, 
and uh, we see that motor and inverter and battery management systems uh, these are very vibrant topics uh, for india right now especially as we look at localization and technology transfers so there is a lot of interest and uh, uh, while uh, you know we obviously do this uh, this video gets also circulated to the uh, entire industry members uh, uh, you know post uh, post the event so we we do look for, forward to uh, get uh, more traction and uh, more discussions uh, more deeper elements uh, right and uh, and try to see how how uh, you know obviously cost optimization but more than that product optimization right have the right product for the right country for the right environment for the right application uh, that is that is what uh, is the most critical uh, it is very easy to pull together the uh, the electric vehicle uh, uh, right uh, taking components from multiple places and putting it all together it's like uh, now Uh, anybody's job uh, like uh, you can write a to- 10 steps right but it is not going to be a optimized uh, solution and uh, that is where uh, the, the the problem is even the solution which is not optimized is going to be more efficient than the ic engine out there uh, right so uh, right now folks are not focused towards optimization but uh, that that is uh, that is changing right so uh, anyone in the audience uh, ganesh sir if you would like to share something uh, how was uh, the discussion today as you rightly said now you are arriving at compound level and already you covered uh, the systemic level discussion prior to this i have joined for the first time and uh, i am uh, finding it a bit uh, difficult to understand this electrical uh, motors because i am from mechanical side and i am working on this ev evs uh, retrofit kit developing retrofit kit for evs Uh, i will be catching up with uh, whatever will be uh, delivered in the future that is my remark thank you very much for allowing you to join this forum yeah thank you okay. yeah ganesh i'll i'll pass you the previous lecture link so that you can also yes. you know go through them definitely that will be of help okay, thank you all right uh, i think that's uh, everybody i think that's uh, pretty much it for uh, tech talks today uh, thank you very much uh, for being a patient audience for good questions and of course michael and anti once again thanks a lot and uh, we hope to uh, keep in touch okay yes. thank you bye bye, bye. 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 bye.